going to hell down here in Texas. What's up, everybody? This is your boy, Rob Clark. This is the Lone Gummit Podcast. And this is episode number 213. It is now 2023. New year. New you. New me. Not so much. I'm still the same old crotchety, uh, contrarian that you know and love and I shall not change for anyone but I must make a mea culpa <laughs> and I feel like an asshat for doing it but let me apologize to uh, Roger Maynard not Randy I don't know why I said Randy I must have Randy on the brain um yeah, Roger, May- Roger Maynard from Shepherd on Fire, the band providing this awesome new theme music for the Lone Gummit podcast. Had a lot of uh, compliments about it. Uh, so people are digging it, Roger, and I greatly appreciate it. So there is your mea culpa. You know, I know you said no big deal, but, you know, when people are nice enough to do something for you, at least get their fucking name right. I mean, god damn. I feel like an idiot. I knew I, I fucking knew I should have opened up the message so I remembered correctly and got the name right. And I didn't, and that's my fault. Um, but thank you to Roger again and his band Shepherd on Fire for the, some of the music you'll be listening to here on the show and uh, getting down here on the Lone Gummit Podcast in the new year, baby. So this is going to be kind of a weird episode. And by weird episode, I mean, I don't really have a lot going on for you. Um, I've been spare time digging through these damn documents and really there's not a lot there, folks. Um, you know, I recently had to move uh, my, my office where I do a lot of my work and I cleaned up a lot of shit and paper and files and just stuff that I was stuffed to the gills on that I just randomly collected over the years. And, uh, you know, decided to cram them all into a show here or there. So I've downsized a lot of my own hand material. Um, so today's going to be a little different and we're going to kick it off. All right. With me, Asking for your opinions. I know I know that's a dangerous game. I know that's a dangerous game. <clears throat> but it's not necessarily your opinion on this show or, or me or what I do here or how I do it. Or if you agree with me or if you don't, I don't give a shit. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've been asked over the many years of doing this and why don't don't you write a book man you can write a book uh you know look first of all i just don't have the time to write a quote-unquote research footnoted uh you know riff numbers uh, index. I just don't have the time or the gumption to do it. And uh, look, other people have written books, and that's great. And I applaud them. I could never do it. So I have nothing but the utmost respect for the people that do. 
Um, but that's not my bag. You know, I'd much rather get on here and just spit out my diary of the mouth and, and move on to the next topic. It's very, very, very easy. Um, but I have always wanted to write a fiction or faction uh, book based on historical perspectives in the assassination. You know, much like Libra by Don, Don Belilo or uh, Third Bullet by Stephen Hunter. Um, you know, a lot of these are, are great fiction novels um, that incorporate factual aspects of the Kennedy assassination. And, and, you know, when you do that, you don't have to always, in quote, get it right. And you don't have to always cite your sources and this, that, and the other. You have artistic license. And that's what appeals to me. So when I try to explain, I think, you know, okay, am I really going to do this show for the, you know, 20 or 30 more years? Uh, God damn, I hope not. Uh, hopefully, at some point, uh, you would think that there's going to be some kind of conclusion to all this. At least, I hope there is. Um, but, you know, what am I going to do for my coup de grace? You know, my my finalité, my, my finale. Um, and I think that would be to write a book. And I think that would be to write a faction book. Historical-based faction. And in that context of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not literary, but well, maybe it is literary uh, concept. You know, I could do what I want to do without having to do all the bullshit, basically. Um, that is, put forth my point of view based on, you know, 30, 40 plus years at that point when the book comes out. Uh, of research into this topic and putting it into a fiction based format of how I think the assassination came together and went down and include all the colorful characters. You know what I mean? So I'm going to ask you for your opinion. I'm going to have a very, very rough draft of part of the first chapter that I've written that I'm going to read to you here on the show today. Because I don't know if I'm a good writer. I don't know if this is something that you guys would be interested in reading. So I'm asking for some feedback. And if I get enough positive feedback um, or constructive criticism, if you will, then, <clears throat> then I will continue. And if people say, hey, wow, this shit's trash, you know, um, then I'm not going to waste my time. But here we go. You know, and I, I've, I've muddled around with titles and this and that, and I think I'm going to wait till I'm done writing the book to actually give it a title because I don't want to be constrained by the inference of the title. So I think once I get the book written in, in its entirety, the title will come. So no title yet. And any assholes out there don't steal my idea, okay? Nuts. Okay, so here we go. And I'm a little nervous. I'm going to lie. Okay, here we go. Midnight, November 21st. Like taking candy from a baby, the man thought as he reached up and grabbed the bottom rung of the fire escape. He tossed a long package up onto the bottom walkway and pulled himself up. Under the cover of darkness, he hastily but quietly made his way up the rickety old ironwork strapped to the side of the old brick building. After arriving at the end of the proverbial road, he counted windows back down to make sure he had arrived at the right floor. Sixth. Confident he had, he pushed up on the window frame. And 
and wouldn't budge. He slid a small crowbar out of his back pocket and got to work. The heat had warped the frame something awful over the years, but with a little leverage, up she came. Not quite all the way, but enough for him to slide through. He paused for a moment to let his eyes adjust to his dismal, dirty, dark, and dreary surroundings. The window he needed was right there at the corner. Crowbar already in hand, he got to work on this window. It came up rather nicely. He set the crowbar down on the sill of the window adjacent to the one that he needed. Out of his coat pocket, he pulled his thin motorcycle gloves out of the pocket and put them on. Carefully, he arranged some boxes nearby as a kind of rifle rest. He even pushed the box down with the package to make a dent. He then got to work on the package. He opened one end and slid out his contents. One certified Italiano man liquor carcano six and a half millimeter carbide. Sans bayonet. He folded the pa package paper and set it in the corner. Then he weaved his way around the skids and stacks of boxes marked books to the opposite end of the floor from where he entered. There he carefully placed the rifle in between two stacks of books by the entrance to the stairwell. Almost done, he thought. He hustled back to the window and removed a small envelope from his pocket. He shook the contents onto the floor in front of the window. Satisfied with the way the shelves had fallen and rolled, he exited the same way he had come in, pushing the window down tight behind him. At the bottom of the fire escape, he pushed a spring-loaded ladder back up into position, looked around at the empty streets, and vanished into the night. Two a.m. Lucas B and B restaurant. It was getting late. He was starting to feel it now. His kneecap almost banging the tabletop as it jumped up and down with anticipation. He was starting to think he was going to get stood up. He had been a good soldier for the boss in the past couple of weeks, doing whatever was asked of him, even improvising a bit once in a while. It was fun work pretending to be somebody else. He thought. As the little bell rang again, as the old diner door scraped the bottom of it, and a man wearing a suit and fedora walked in. Over here, Jack, he said loudly, motioned for him to come over to the booth. The stocky man ambled over and plunked his hat on the table as he slid hastily into the booth. What the fuck are you doing yelling my goddamn name, you idiot? Jack seized. Sorry, boss, I just wanted to make sure you seen me. I've been waiting here a while. Jack looked at the kid. He was a good kid. He did what was asked. It's okay, Larry. Sorry I couldn't get away any sooner. You know how it is. The business I'm in. People always wanting, needing something. Jack said with a sigh as he smoothed his hair back. A tired, sad-looking waitress made her way to the booth where the men sat. Can I get you fine gentlemen anything? She asked as she popped her gum loudly. Her name tag read Mary. Two coffees, black and strong, and two bacon sandwiches, darling. And bring the bill with it, then make yourself scarce. We got business to discuss, Jack said with a smile and a wink. Sure thing, mister. Mary smiled back, and she turned, rolled her eyes, and thought to herself, Great, another big tipper. As Mary swished away, Larry had to tear himself away from the sound of her pantyhose rubbing together under her skirt and the visual intruding into his tired braining. Boss, I was thinking. Larry started as Jack held up a meaty hand. Just wait a goddamn minute when we get our food. I don't want to be interrupted. Jack said, glaringly. Excuse me, goddamn. With a frustrated sigh, Larry stared out the window at the garish neon sign. Order up! Larry heard faintly in the distance, coming from a gruff, garish, disembodied voice. After a minute or so, Mary sauntered over with the coffee, sandwiches, and the bill. Here you go, boys. Enjoy. Jack handed her a crisp $10 bill. Keep the change, toots. And a surprised Mary shuffled lightly away and held up the bill to the light to examine its authenticity. Pleasantly surprised, she stuffed it into her apron pocket and made her way towards the kitchen, where she anticipated ducking out the back door for a quick smoke. Back at the table. Okay, 
Tell me you got everything done, just as I told you, Jack said. Sure did, boss. You were right about that house in Irving. Those women left about 10 a.m. and went over a couple of houses to their neighbors. Front door was unlocked. I grabbed the rifle out of the garage, put it in that paper bag you gave me. I walked over to Bill's house and had him drive me back to Dallas. Larry explained. Did anybody see you tonight? Jack asked. I made sure the coast was clear, boss. Clean in and clean out. Larry winced as he took a bite of his bacon sandwich. Normally, he'd opt for an egg sandwich, which was a little easier to eat given his current tooth situation. Excellent, my dear boy. Soon it will all be over, and you and me are going to be just a little bit richer, Jack said with a wink as he shoved the last bite of sandwich into his mouth. They then, as quietly as possible, discussed how the next day was going to go. Confident that Larry understood everything he was to do, it was time to get some shut-eye. To easy money, my friend, and to the end of that traitorous pinko commie-loving bastard once and for all, Jack said, raising his coffee cup. And a new set of partials, Larry said laughingly, as his cup clinked Jack's and they both let the rest of the scalding liquid, or they both let the rest of the scalding liquid rocket down their respective esophagi. Get out of here, kid. Get some rest. Big day tomorrow. We should, we should get some rest, Jack said as he dabbed the corners of his crooked smile. Night, boss, Larry said as he stood up, slung on his Eisenhower-style jacket, and walked towards the door. God damn, that kid looks like Oswald at a glance. He even got his walk down flat, Jack thought. What a beautiful gift this kid was from the general. Back at his apartment, after dropping the kid off at the club, Ruby sauntered in the door and hung his hat and sport coat on the rack inside the doorway. A lazy eye slowly opened from the fur ball laying on the couch. Jack paused on his way to the bedroom to pet his beautiful girl, Sheba. Who's the most beautiful girl in the world? Jack crooned as he stroked her sleek little skull. He sauntered away, shedding his clothes as he made his way back to the bedroom. He nudged the sleeping form lying on the bed. Scoot over, George, and turn over. I brought you a little something home, Jack chuckled as he climbed into bed. Meanwhile, a couple of blocks away, Larry stared at the rotted wood ceiling of the closet that had become his bedroom. He swore he could hear the faint scurrying and scratches of the carousel's other tenants as they foraged for leftover crumbs that had made their way to the disgusting floor of the club. How could he possibly sleep knowing what was going down tomorrow? He didn't want to drink a few beers because a few would turn into a few too many and he might not wake up in time. It was a big day tomorrow, and he could not screw this up. Finally, he would have enough money to move back to Oregon and make things right with the girl and the baby that he'd left behind. And with that thought, he drifted off into a much-needed and deserved rest. Okay, folks. That's all you get for now. I just want to know whether or not you think I should keep going or hang it up. And this is, like I said, this is a very rough draft. And just in reading that to you, I, I, I envisioned certain places where I might add some more um, descriptive uh, words and images. You know, because I like, when I read, I like to be immersed in, in the scene and the scenery and, uh, you know, really feel and think like you're there. And, uh, you know, like, like for instance, um, you know, when we're talking about how the uh, the heat had warped the frame or something awful over the years. You know, I think uh, when I read that, I was thinking maybe I should put in there, you know, the sweltering Texas heat had warped the frame something awful over the years. You know, just to give a little bit more gravitas. Um, just little things like that. You may, you know, maybe add some crumbs, uh, you know, falling down Ruby's corners of his mouth. Um, you know, nothing crazy. Um, but yeah, so look, just let me know what you think, guys. Good or bad, I want to hear it. Uh, honest, honest, honest. So let me know. Uh, let's see, you can give me feedback at, at the Lone Gunman. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not at. Just the Lone Gunman Podcast at gmail.com or on Twitter 
at the learning gunman seven. Best ways to get a hold of me. Um, so let me know what you think. There, now I'm gonna pull my balls back in my pants and uh, button them up, and continue with the show. So for the rest of the show, we're gonna be basically focusing on a couple different characters in Ruby's life. And the first one <laughs> made a sleeping uh, appearance in what I just read you in Jack Ruby's bed. So <laughs> now, look, I don't really know if they were bagging each other or what was going on. I don't know. That is just based on some of the rumors, you know, that surround Ruby and, and, and George Senator. Um, but from what I'm going to read you, I, 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 you know, unless, 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 uh, George Senator was bisexual. Um, and I'm pretty sure Ruby was bisexual, um, from some of the stories um, that you hear about him and the business that he was in. Um, it's possible. Okay, I just thought it would be a, you know funnier in the story uh, if if they were bisexual. But as you'll clearly see from this article, uh, George Sinner had actually been married at one point and had kids, so he was either straight or bi. Uh, and for the purposes of this story, he's going to be bi. Um. So who was George Senator anyway? You know, Jack Ruby's roommate. And I came across this uh, story uh, written in 2021 uh, from the, a Gloversville, and I don't know where the hell that is, maybe New York, uh, Daily Gazette, focus on history. They'll always point to Jack Ruby's roommate. He was from Gloversville. So George Senator. Gloversville native was living in Dallas with Jack Ruby 58 years ago on November 24th, 1963. Ruby, a strip club operator, left their apartment that day and ended up in the basement of police headquarters. There, he shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald was in custody for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy two days earlier as the motorcade drove through Dallas. The FBI interviewed George Senator, attorneys from the Warren Commission, headed by Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren, also interviewed George Senator. When the marathon deposition was at an end, Senator said, they will always point to Jack Ruby's roommate, Jack Ruby's roommate, something of that nature. Born in 1913, George Senator was the son of Abraham and Anna Senator. He dropped out of school after eighth grade. He moved to the Bronx, where he lived with his sister and worked at a company that provided silk for women's dresses and undergarments. In 1932, he returned to Gloversville and worked at a restaurant called Senators, owned by his brother Jacob. The restaurant was on North Main Street and later Church Street. In 1941, George Senator enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was an armorer with the 5th Air Force in the Australian and Pacific Theater during World War II. After the war, Senator operated a luncheonette in New York City. He married Shirley Barron, and they had a son named Bobby. Bobby Barron. No, actually, it would have been Bobby Senator. Never mind. George and Shirley then got a divorce, and their son lived with his mother, who remarried. Senator later sold women's wear in Florida for a firm based in Chicago, and then the company sent him to Dallas in 1954. In Dallas, Senator sold women's wear and picture postcards. That sounds like certainly a lucrative business there. Hey, you want to buy a postcard for a penny? He began doing work for strip club owner Jack Ruby. Ruby was born Jacob Leon Rubenstein in Chicago. 
When Senator was unemployed in 1962, Ruby took him in. Senator off, Senator moved out uh, when he found work and also found another roommate. Ruby moved to the same apartment building where Senator was now staying from where he was previously staying. Senator's new roommate got married, that son of a bitch, and moved out. Senator then again moved in with Jack Ruby the first week of November 1963. So, Senator moved in with Ruby the first week of November 1963. The Sunday after the president died, Ruby received a call from Karen Carlin, one of the dancers at his club. According to George Senator, Ruby left the apartment at 11 a.m. to pick up receipts from the Carousel Club and to wire money to Karen Carlin, also known as Little Lynn, in Fort Worth. Ruby took his gun, which Senator said Ruby usually did when he was retrieving money from the club. He also put his dog Sheba in the car. Senator told the Warren Commission he didn't know why Ruby killed Oswald. He never at any time ever gave me any indication that he was going to do anything of that nature. Some assassination websites, however, state that Senator told investigator Arlen Specter, yes, that Arlen Specter, that before leaving the apartment, Ruby did say he planned to kill Oswald. The shooting was broadcast live on national television. The first ever murder broadcast live on national television. Senator met that night in the apartment with his lawyer. Hey, Joey B. Joe Borelli, wake up, son. I got something for you. Senator met that night in the apartment with his lawyer, Jim Martin. What do you think about that? Add him to the list. Of J. Martins's. Ruby's lawyer, Tom Howard, and two journalists, Bill Hunter and Jim Both. Senator told the Warren Commission he was scared for about 10 days after Oswald was killed. In other words, for about 10 days, I was afraid to sleep in the same place twice. Senator was a defense witness at Ruby's trial. Ruby was sentenced to death, but appealed the conviction. Ruby then died from pneumonia and lung complications in 1967 while awaiting a new trial. Jacob's senator, George's brother, died in Gloversville in 1969, and George's senator was listed then as living in Las Vegas. George Senator died in the spring of 1992, according to Dave Reese's of the Spartacus Educational website. So there you have a little bit more information on Mr. George Senator, the possibly straight roommate of Jack Ruby. Now, of course, when discussing, uh, Jack Ruby and George Senator after Jack Ruby shot Oswald I would be remiss as to not mention the meeting held the evening of November 24th at Jack Ruby's apartment with George Senator present his lawyer Jim Martin Ruby's lawyer Tom Howard and newsmen Bill Hunter and Jim Coth. All right. Now, after Ruby shot Oswald, homicide detective Gus Rose arrived at Ruby's apartment at about 2 p.m. that Sunday, accompanied by two other Dallas officers and armed with a search warrant issued by Justice of the Peace Joe Brown Jr. I showed the manager the warrant and she let us right in, Rose recalled in an October 92 interview. We were there for about an hour and a half and we searched the place thoroughly. 
According to Rose, the search failed to turn up anything of significance. We collected a few notes and telephone numbers that had been written on pads, but that was about all we took. Once we were finished, we just locked the place back up and left again. And uh, apparently, when all the fellas that I mentioned earlier met that evening for their meeting uh, to discuss what they were going to do about Ruby and what he did, and, and now that he's in prison and this, that, and the other, they never even realized that the apartment had been broken into, well, not broken into, but searched. Um, apparently, Gus Rose and the other two fellas that were doing the uh, search warrant, executing the search warrant, were very meticulous and careful not to leave things out of place or put things back where they found them. Um, yeah, they say they never realized it because nothing was messed up, which is crazy. So I'm going to read you a little bit from the Spartacus Educational website about George Senator. It's some of the same information, but uh, it's uh, also a little bit more information. So uh, it says George Senator was born in Gloversville on the 4th of September, 1913. Later, he moved to New York where he worked for a company producing women's garments. During the Second World War, Senator served in the United States Army. After leaving service in 1945, September, he returned to New York where he worked for a company called Denise Foods. After the failure of his marriage, Senator moved to Miami where he found employment in a restaurant. Later, he worked in Milwaukee at Ray Manufacturing and Chicago for the Smoller Brothers. In 1954, Senator moved to Dallas where he worked as a traveling salesman. Later, he sold picture postcards. In 1962, Senator moved in with Ruby. He paid no rent, but in return, he did occasional work in Ruby's Carousel Club. According to the attorney, Jim Martin, Senator was, quote, overwhelmed with fear after the assassination of John F. Kennedy and talked about leaving Dallas. Senator told the Warrant Commission that on 24th November that Ruby received a phone call from Little Lynn, a carousel stripper who lived in Fort Worth at about 10.20 p.m. that morning. I'm guessing that's supposed to be 10.20 a.m. Uh, Ruby left the apartment soon afterwards, and when Ruby testified before the commission, he told Arlen Specter that, uh, that that morning that he... Wait a minute. When Ruby testified before the commission... He told Arlen Specter that he had told George Senator that morning that he had plans to kill Lee Harvey Oswald. This is supported by the fact that Senator phoned Jim Martin, a lawyer, a Dallas lawyer, five minutes before Ruby actually shot Oswald. Interesting. Larry Crayford testified before the Warrant Commission that on 23 November 63, he went with Ruby and Senator to photograph an impeach Earl Warren billboard in Dallas. Ruby said he wanted to photograph the billboard because of its similarity to an anti-Kennedy advertisement that appeared in newspapers on the day of the assassination. This information created some interest as it had not been mentioned by either Ruby or Senator. On the day that Oswald died, Bill Hunter of the Long Beach Press-Telegram and Jim Coth of the Dallas Times-Herald interviewed George Senator in Ruby's apartment. Also there was Ruby's attorney, Tom Howard, and George Senator's attorney, Jim Martin. Earlier that day, Senator and Howard had both visited Jack Ruby in jail. That evening, Senator arranged for Coth, Hunter, and Howard to search Ruby's apartment for clues. It is not known what the journalist found, but on 23 April 64, Bill Hunter was shot dead by Creighton Wiggins, 
Mrs. Wiggins, a policeman in the press room of a Long Beach police station. Wiggins initially claimed that his gun fired when he dropped it and tried to pick it up. In court, this was discovered that this was impossible, and it was decided that Hunter had been murdered. Wiggins finally admitted he was playing a game of quick draw with his fellow officer. The other officer, Errol Greenleaf, testified he had his back turned when the shooting took place. In January of 1965, both were convicted and sentenced to three long years of probation. Emphasis on irony mine. Uh, yeah. Now, Jim Cove, he, he worked as a reporter for the Dallas Times Herald. And he was involved in the investigation of the killing of President John F. Kennedy. And on the 24th of November, 63, Coth and Bill Hunter from the Long Beach Press Telegram interviewed George Senator. Um, Jim Coth decided to write a book about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. However, he died on the 21st of September, 1964. It seems that a man broke into his Dallas apartment and killed him by a karate chop to the throat. Okay. Uh, so, in 1983, Pen Jones uh, disappearing witnesses. Uh, included in the Rebel magazine shortly after dark on Sunday night, November 24th, 1963, after Ruby had killed Oswald, a meeting took place in Ruby's apartment in Oak Cliff, a suburb of Dallas. Five persons were present, present George Senator, Tom Howard, Bill Hunter, Jim Coth, and Jim Martin. Attorney C.A. Droby of Dallas, arranged the meeting for the two newsmen. Jim Martin, a close friend and lawyer of George Senator's, was also present at the me at the apartment meeting. Uh, I guess Penn Jones had asked Martin if he thought it was unusual for Senator to forget the meeting while testifying in Washington on April 22, 1964, since Bill Hunter, who was a newsman present in the meeting, was shot to death that very night. Martin grinned and said, oh, you're looking for a conspiracy. I nodded yes, and he grinned and said, well, you never find it. I asked soberly, never find it or not there? Uh, and Martin said, not there. And then, uh, of course, Bill Hunter, a native of Dallas and an award-winning newsman in Long Beach, was on duty and reading a book in the police station called the Public safety building. Two policemen going off duty came into the press room and one policeman shot Hunter through the heart at a range officially ruled to be no, ruled to be no more than three feet away. The policeman had said that he dropped his gun and it fired as he, as he picked it up, but the angle of the bullet caused him to change his story. He finally said he was playing a game of quick draw with the fellow officer and the other officer testified he had his back turned when the shooting took place. Hunter, who covered the assassination for his paper, the Long Beach Press-Telegram had written within minutes of Ruby's execution of Oswald before the eyes of millions watching tele on television, at least two Dallas attorneys appeared to talk with him. Hunter was quoting Tom Howard who had died of a heart attack in Dallas a few months after Hunter's own death. Lawyer Tom Howard was observed acting strangely to his friends two days before his death. Howard was taken to the hospital by a friend, according to the newspapers. No autopsy was performed. Tom Howard was 48. Okay, folks. Nothing to see here. He died of old age. So, out of all the people at this meeting, 
Ruby's apartment with George Senator and his lawyer, Jim Martin. We have Tom Howard, Bill Hunter, and Jim Coth all dying. All dying within a year and a half after this meeting. Dallas Times Herald reporter Jim Coth was killed by a karate chop to the throat. Just as he emerged from a shower, Dick just swinging in the wind in his apartment on September the 21st, 1964. His murderer was not indicted, folks. Yeah, that's right. You heard me correctly. His lawyer or his, his killer was not indicted. What went on in that significant meeting in Ruby in Senator's apartment that night. Few are left to tell. There was no one in authority to ask the question since the Warren Commission has made its final report and the House Select Committee has closed its investigation. So, why wasn't the killer of, of Jim Coth indicted? So, the body of a young Dallas reporter was found um, hold on. Yeah, the body of a young Dallas reporter was found nude, swathed in a blanket on the floor of his bachelor apartment. All these bachelor guys, you know what that means, wink, wink. Uh, September the 21st, 64. Police said the cause of death was asphyxiation from a broken bone at the base of the neck, apparently the result of a hyena. Karate chop. Robbery appeared to be the motive, <laughs> although Coast's parents believed he was killed for other reasons. Whoever ransacked his apartment, they point out, was careful to remove his notes for a book he was writing on the Kennedy assassination in collaboration with two other journalists. Within a week, a 22-year-old ex-con from Alabama named Larry Earl Reno was picked up selling Coast personal effects and held on suspicion of murder. Reno's lawyers, with the guy allegedly uh, that killed uh, Jim Coast, right? Okay, Reno's lawyers or a fellow by the name of Mike Barkley and the ubiquitous Jim Martin, though, Joey B., Joe Borelli. So the guy that killed Jim Coth, his lawyer, was also George Senator's lawyer, this chat named Jim Martin. Martin and Senator, one recalls, were with Coth at the enigmatic meeting on November the 24th, 1963. And when the Reno case crime or came before the grand jury, District Attorney, our old friend Henry Wade, secretly instructed the jurors not to indict Reno, an extraordinary move for a chief prosecuting officer with a strong case as it was. The grand jury returned a no bill. Reno, however, remained in jail on a previous charge. And when they finally sprang him in January of 1965, he was rearrested within a month for the robbery of a hotel. This time, the prosecution led by a one-time law partner of Martin's had no qualms about getting an indictment and a conviction. Reno was sentenced to life for the hotel robbery. At the trial, his lawyers called no witnesses in his defense. What the hell, folks? I mean, you know, there's crazy, and then there's crazy. And that's crazy. All these intricacies and conspiracies and, oh, nothing to see here, folks. Yeah, okay. And then there's this from an article in Fair Play Magazine by Gary Schoner, May of 2000. 
Nim Coast was a reporter actively researching the assassination and collecting data, possibly in preparation for the writing of a book. Shortly before the publication of the Warren Report on 9-11-1964, he was found dead on the floor of his apartment. The cause of death was asphyxiation due to a broken neck bone, myeloid bone, the result of strangulation or a blow to the neck. Hey, yeah. The karate chop. The apparent motive was robbery. The apartment was ransacked, and a 22 year old ex con named Larry Earl Reno was arrested within a week when he was caught red handed selling post personal effects. Reno was not indicted, uh, although shortly afterwards he was in prison for another offense. Those notes never showed up, and there was no way of knowing if they contained anything of substance. Both was one of the few reporters to visit Jack Ruby's apartment the evening Ruby shot Oswald. Another reporter who was there that night, Bill Hunter, was later to be shot to death in California in a police station. His death was ruled to be accidental. The result of a police officer who was just horsing around pointed a loaded gun at him and pulled the trigger. The officer was allegedly a friend of his. <laughs> Some friend. That's the kind of friends you don't need, folks. Uh, you know, so take that for what it's worth. It's a lot of information to take in. Is there anything of substance here? I don't know. Uh, like I said, George Senator didn't die until 1992, and he was a he was probably in his 50s um, when he was rooming up with uh, Jack Ruby. So he lived a nice long life. Um, you know, if he was in his 50s in 1963. And 30 years later, he died. I mean, you know, he's in his 80s, upper 80s, mid mid to upper 80s. So, Senator lived a good long life, but nobody else at that meeting did. Except for his lawyer, Jim Martin, apparently. Uh, but everybody else, totally screwed. And uh, for some reason, Henry Wade let, let off Jim Coe's killer, even though he was caught red-handed with his stuff. And he had stolen all of Coe's work on his investigation into the Kennedy assassination. Hmm. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. So one thing mentioned here is the, the uh, odd trip that Larry Craver, George Senator, and Jack Ruby took in the wee hours of the early morning on the day after the assassination, November 23rd. And this is the last thing that Larry Crafer does with Jack Ruby and George Senator before Larry Crafer decides to hightail it the fuck out of town. Okay? So apparently they go out and they find this billboard, this uh, in, impeach Earl Warren billboard, right? And then they go to the post office to look for this P.O. box that was mentioned uh, either on the billboard or in the uh, wanted, wanted for treason ad that had been taken out in the paper. I can't remember which. Um but supposedly this is something Jack Ruby wanted to do, and he took George Senator and Larry Crayford along with him to do it. Um, now, we know Larry Crayford, quote, quote unquote, worked at the Carousel Club, uh, basically in exchange for room and board. And apparently, uh, George Senator was doing much of the same thing, only he got to stay with Jack Ruby in his bedroom. Not enough room for three, Larry. Sorry, my boy. Sorry, my boy. But came across something from the Garrison investigation written by his investigator, uh, Bill Boxley. And it's kind of his observations on Larry Crayford, R.E. Larry Crayford, reference, references to Boeing Insurance Union Drilling Company. Number one. 
Larry Crafer's entire testimony is textbook quality for any intelligence services course in resistance to interrogation. It is a classic in the art of selective recall. Now this is, of course, coming from Bill Boxley, otherwise known as William Wood, a former CIA employee. Okay. So if anybody knows these techniques, it's this guy. So take that into consideration when I read you the rest of this. Number two, attached are a few examples of facets which fascinate me in his testimony, although all 200 pages of it are full of them. On the whole, Crayford seems extremely sharp at detecting and avoiding the nuances of Hubert's questions. His handling of the English language is nothing less than expert for a lad who barely compiled three years of high school and who was given a general under honorable conditions discharge out of the army from Germany after 13 months of service in 1959 when H.O.W. Bockelman was leaving Germany for an intelligence assignment in the U.S. Number three, Crayford is able to remember job details in his past, which no other itinerant I've ever known could recall. At the same time, he appears to be able to anticipate Hubert's heading into an area where a memory blackout would seem beneficial to him. Number four, on the whole, Rayford appears to be traveling in the offbeat church league, perhaps as a courier or better. He refers to his church several times in the testimony and once identifies it as the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn in Dallas. Naturally, no such church is listed in the 1963 Dallas telephone directory or the memory of anyone else ever interviewed in Dallas about this church. He hits all the key spots in his travels from West Coast Washington to Long Beach to Dallas to Memphis. He seems to maintain fantastic communications for a drifter, relying only on what friends write relatives who write him who write to him. Hubert calls recesses and goes off the record at two were three key points in the testimony. But overall, Crayford has to pull Hubert out of more holes than Hubert does Crayford. Example, when Griffin asks of Union Drilling Company's predecessors, were they Michigan companies or were they people? Crayford rescues him with a quick Michigan companies, with a quick, they were mission companies, period. And Griffin recesses until the next day, last page of volume 13. Number six, what Crafer's role may have been is impossible to speculate, but on the face of his testimony, it appears at least as interesting as Jack Lawrence's. He actually was unaccounted for during the morning of the assassination until God knows when in the afternoon. For there is only his word, and possibly that of Andy Armstrong, Jack Ruby's faithful slave and one of the most unbelievable elements of his testimony covers the period of 1 to 3.30 a.m. on Saturday morning of November 23rd when he allegedly kept the phone tied up talking to a female he'd never seen or heard from before. If this had been covered to have accounted for the telephone having been busy uh, that long, that length of time in case reporters or others may have tried to call Ruby and learned it was busy while Ruby was supposed to have been out of the club. We don't really know where Crayford was all day and night, Friday, November 22nd. He got away before he could be quested by any Dallas police or newsman, and he did not surface until the FBI talked with him in Michigan uh, on Thanksgiving Day. Finally, his hitchhiking toward Florida from Claire, Michigan, and being picked up by an unknown benefactor who gave him lodging and something uh, right there in Michigan, until, oh, and a job uh, right there in Michigan until the Ruby trial is too perfect. And then he gets mixed up on why 
he must get to Dallas in time for the Ruby trial. So there's a somewhat analysis of uh, Larry Crayford by a former CIA man. Uh, you know, when it comes to his observations concerning Larry Crayford and his level of intelligence, intelligence and acumen when it comes to interrogation and questioning. Very interesting. Very interesting. And here's a little bit more randomness for you. I came across a a uh, I guess a flow chart you might call it. Um, from researcher Carol Hewitt, and this was comprised for the ARRB public hearings, uh, Washington D.C., October eleventh, nineteen ninety four. Circumstantial links. Okay, this is to Jack Ruby. So the HSCA speculated that Ruby and Bertha Cheek running guns on behalf of Cuban exiles in 1963. Okay. Perhaps still classified. Marita Lorenz testified that Ruby and E. Howard Hunt met with man from Miami in a motel room and exchanged money several days before the assassination. Source, the HSCA. Nancy Perrin Rich testified that Ruby running guns in 1962 with assistance of an army colonel. Source, Warren Commission. John Elrod told the FBI that his cellmate and an injured prisoner in the jail caught with guns met with Ruby in a motel room days before the assassination. Source, Warren Commission Files. Miller and Witter, the two arrested on November the 18th, both injured in a car chase and found with military weapons from Armory in Terrell, Texas. Source, Public Records. John Thomas Mason. Brokering military weapons between Army Ordnance Officers Captain George Monty Cuban exiles, right-wing groups, and also brokering uh, info that invasion of Cuba set for the end of November. Source, newly released documents. Links to Ruby. Okay. Miller, one of the men arrested for running guns in Dallas. and uh, Miller worked for the McCords. Ruby knew McCords. Darnell Witter serviced Ruby's car. He was Ruby's mechanic, basically. Um, Miller dies in an apartment owned by Bertha Cheek. The ATF believed that Miller and Witter working with Mason were working with John Thomas Mason. Jack Ruby met with Bertha Cheek on November the 18th. Ruby met with Colonel Sam Baker from the Terrell Armory on November the 19th. This is the day after Miller and Witter arrested in Dallas and injured in a car chase found with military weapons from an army from an armory in Terrell, Texas. Okay, let me read that again. Jack Ruby met with Colonel Sam Baker from the Terrell Armory on November the 19th, one day after Miller and Witter were arrested. Ruby visits Bondsman and an attorney on November the 19th after the arrest of Miller and Witter on November the 18th. Okay, so we have Ruby in touch with a colonel from the Terrell Armory that Miller and Witter had just stolen guns from. And then after he talks to him, Ruby visits a Bondsman and an attorney on November the 19th after the arrest of Miller and Witter on November the 18th. Uh, John Thomas Mason is arrested November 20th for possession of military weapons and bonds out. 
Miller and Witter, represented by attorney May, who is related to McClendon, a friend of Jack Ruby. Other links, Mason to Oswald. John Thomas Mason looked like Oswald. HSCA photo missing. Mason, one of two gun dealers in Dallas with Western cartridge 6.5 millimeter Manica Carcano ammo. Still classified, a 14-page statement made by Witter to the HSCA withdrawn by the NSA. So, there's a lot of interesting information right there about our man, Jack Ruby. And this kind of ties into the episode last week, you know, Shine Bright Like a Ruby um, and his gun running activities. So, put this together with that and man, oh man, does the fire keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Whew. And I'm going to end it here with one more document that I had saved on my phone here. For whatever reason, randomness uh, doesn't really have anything to do with Jack Ruby per se. Um, but this is a report um, filed by Emily Delsa for the HSCA concerning uh, Lawrence Howard Jr., also known as Larry. Fat Larry, Pancho Villa, and others. Birth date, approximately 1933. Uh, approximate age in 1952 was 19. Approximate age in 1971 was 38. Uh, approximate age in 1963 was 30. Approximate age in 1976, 43. Descent, Mexican-American, father, Lawrence J. Howard Sr., Caucasian, mother, don't know her name, Mexican. Height, six foot, weight, 250 approximately, complexion, dark, hair, black, often wears a beard or mustache, handlebar, Manchurian, or Pancho Villa style. Slight limp in one foot when tired. Education, high school, California, U.S. Army, retired, Korea, 1952. Speaks English, Spanish, and some Korean and Japanese. Some intelligence background, question mark. Expert knife fighter, expert in infiltration, guerrilla warfare, guerrilla warfare, demolition, assassination, and hit team organization. Self-professed soldier of fortune, Member of anti-Castro Cuban organizations from 1961 to 1963. Was identified as being in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. Questioned by the Warren Commission investigators after the 14-hour lid was closed on the investigation. Warren report states he, Howard, was at work in Montebello, California on November the 22nd, 1963. In, in parentheses, he was not. Subpoenaed by Garrison in 1968. And at last contact, Lawrence Howard was heavily armed and fearful for his life. <laughs> okay. Take that for what it's worth, folks. I mean, I'm no soothsayer or anything, but there is a report that I would like to talk to L.J. Delso about. Oh, go for sure. Anyway, that's it for this week, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking it out. And make sure you let me know what you think about the book. Follow along on Twitter at the Lone Gummit Seven. On Facebook, just check, search for the Facebook page, the Lone Gummit Podcast. And on YouTube, make sure you are liking and subscribing and asking to get notified of new episodes and that would greatly help a brother out or feel free to leave a five star review anywhere you listen to the show it would be much and greatly appreciated by your boy until next time folks this is your boy 
Big Bad Bob with you. Peace. Bad to Bob with you.